Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to another lecture of our series, Otherworlding. We are getting now to the equator of our semester, and we are heading into a, an intense series of lectures and workshops in the next coming weeks and months. So I invite uh, the, the international audience to, to follow up in, in our newsletter. Uh, but today, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy and honored to introduce our host, uh, an artist that represents very well our quest this semester of exploring new realms and worlds beyond our bodily possibilities. Uh, as well as in certain aspects, expanding the notions of cross-disciplinarity between the arts and the sciences. Uh, Libby Heaney is a British visual artist working with time-based media, performance, sculpture, and print with a background in quantum physics and quantum computing. Her research focuses on phenomena like quantum entanglement and quantum computing possibilities extending to the arts. Heaney obtained a first class degree in physics from the Imperial College in London and a PhD in quantum information science from the University of Leeds. In 2008, uh, Hini won the HSBC and the Institute of Physics Very Early Career Woman Physicist of the Year and a prestigious EPSRC postdoctoral fellowship. After that, he went to study uh, art at Central St. Martins and now works at the intersection of advanced technologies, science and art. She's widely recognized as a pioneer of quantum computing and art, writing bespoke code for IBM's quantum computers, animating objects, edit videos, and create prints in ways never envisioned with quantum computing. Uh, her artwork, ENT, won the 22 Lumen Prize, the Arts and Science Falling Wall Prize, and was nominated for the Stars Prize 2022. Hini also works with machine learning, computer game software, and VR. Her works have been exhibited, performed, and screened at major organizations and institutions internationally in the UK, including the Tate Modern, VNA, the Barbican, ICA, South Bank Center, the Serpentine, and the Lorry in Manchester, the LIDAR Space in Berlin, ZKM in Karlsruhe, and the Center for Contemporary Art in Barcelona and the Fundación Telefónica in Lima, just to, to name a few ones. So uh, without further ado, let's welcome Libby Hini to Fabrica and thanks for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Fabrica, for inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure to speak with everyone today um, and to kind of reflect on my practice over the last year and so working with quantum computing. It's been really, really fun putting this presentation together for you. Um, so I'll just start by sharing my slides. Okay. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the plural possibilities of quantum. Um, so before we start, I'll just share with you a little bit of my background, because as, as Carlos mentioned there, I kind of have, for the arts at least, I have kind of an unusual background. I got really heavily into quantum physics, quantum computing before I then retrained as an artist. So as Carlos mentioned, I was really investigating I'm going to visit chat. Oh, yeah, cool. I was really investigating phenomena related to something called quantum entanglement. And I published around 20 papers on this topic and other topics like quantum biology. Um, so I guess one of the things that we need to get clear right at the start um, of this lecture is what exactly is quantum physics? 
because it's a word that perhaps a lot of people um, have heard about, but they don't necessarily know what it is besides maybe that it's quite strange or weird or spooky. And these are some of the adjectives that have been used to describe quantum physics previously. So quantum physics or quantum mechanics is a theory that describes a microscopic world. So if you take a hair, and hair obviously is very, very thin, and then if you imagine going maybe a thousand times smaller or 10,000 times smaller, you start to reach the realm of quantum physics. So we're really talking about the level of atoms and molecules, very, very small things. And quantum physics describes how these particles interact, how they exchange energy, how they move around in the world. And when we get to that microscopic level, so scientists can do this in the lab, um, using um, special equipment, um, so kind of beyond microscopes, we're talking much, much smaller than, like, say, the level of a cell that you might see in a microscope in a biology lab. So they use, use different types of microscopes. And then when you get that small, you can start to see matter and light behaving in really strange ways. I should also add that these systems are usually need to be very cold in order to reveal their quantum effect. So we're talking about minus 273 centigrade, um, which is also known as absolute zero on the Kelvin scale. And really then when we go down to that, that really cold, really small, matter starts to behave in a fluid way. It starts to behave like slime in a way. So you can see in this picture, um, this image that I've got on the screen at the moment is the CGI render of some slime. So particles, individual massive particles start to become wave-like and become fluid. So we think of particles like in the macroscopic world to be quite rigid, like a snooker ball or a football. But these atoms start to like spread out across space and time. So they start to become uncertain or indeterminate. And um, scientists since well, there's a long history, but generally since the 1990s, scientists, and a, and a few cases before as well, so I, I don't want to oversimplify things, but scientists started to believe, uh, realize that um, you can use quantum particles and their plurality, the fact that they behave like waves and other phenomenon that I'll talk about shortly. They started to realize they could use these systems to process information in new ways. Um, so you and that's called quantum information science and that's a sort of theory that underpins quantum computing so quantum computers which we'll be speaking a lot about today are, um, are something that are currently being developed by big tech companies uh, scientists and with a lot of public funding government funding um, from rich nations around the world um, there's a huge, huge push, push at the moment. Billions of pounds and dollars worth of investment are going into this field. And scientists are trying to build a, a new computer using these laws of quantum physics. So our current computers, digital computers, whether from your smartphone or going up to like huge supercomputers that tech companies like Google have, these computers are all binary. They process information using zeros and ones in a physical object called a transistor. And a transistor is just a system with high voltage, which will be your one, and low voltage, which will be your zero. So, so notice how the information is encoded on a physical system. Um, and quantum computers now use these strange particles that are slime-like to encode information in new ways. And I'll explain more about this in the next slide. But what I want to say before I do that is that why I want to say why are billions of pounds worth of money being invested into these these technologies is because quantum computers process information or, or will when they're fully developed process information in ways that cannot be done ever on even the biggest digital computers. You could cover you could take the whole earth and covering it, it in a digital computer, supercomputer, and it still would not be able to calculate some of the things uh, that a quantum computer could in a reasonable time. So some of these things are some of the applications that quantum computers are very good at solving 
our um, something called Shaw's algorithm, and this basically is a is a is a program, some code that will run on a quantum computer that will enable whoever owns a quantum computer to decrypt all the currently used encryption. So all of the RSA encryption, all of the blockchains, um, all of that type of um, encryption will be in principle, because there are ways of then making that secure again, but in principle, it will be, they will be able to, whoever owns a computer will, will be able to read that information. So this is why there is an arms race in a in a way, a quantum arms race around these technologies. And, and you don't tend to hear, I mean, at the moment um, in the press, um, there's a lot of conversation about NFTs, AI, web free, not so much about quantum computing, um, because primarily the big tech companies don't want to talk about the negative or potential negative sides of quantum computing or quantum technologies. Um, and the scientists on average, and from my experience, tend to be quite positivist and celebratory around the technology. So one of the things that my art practice does is to start um, exploring the sort of ethics of these tools, how they might impact us so socially, ecologically, economically, and geopolitically, but then also suggest alternatives as well. So when I'm creating these sort of worlds around speculative worlds around quantum computing, I'm trying to sort of present multiple narratives simultaneously. My position is quite strong. Like I'm, I'm kind of against the unfettered, unfettered uh, celebration of technology and and the sort of deregulation around it. I think we should have lots of conversations around new technologies, but I like to present multiple viewpoints at once. So I like to almost, like my practice is almost slimy. It starts to stretch over multiple possibilities. So let's jump into quantum computing a little bit. I've, I've, I've um, let me just skip to the next slide. There we go. So um, <laughs> that was a short introduction to the whole field. Um, feel free to save up your questions and we can have a discussion about it at the end. This um, is one of the things I wanted to show you to sort of highlight how different quantum computing is to digital computing. So this image you see on the screen, the, the diagram, is, is what's known as the block sphere representation of a quantum bit. So this is a model from the science literature, from the quantum computing literature. And it, it shows kind of a, a diagrammatical way of, of representing um, what's known as a qubit. So a quantum bit, scientists often shorten it to say a qubit. And this is a basic unit of information within a quantum computer. OK, so let's take a step back. And if we imagine a digital computer and a bit, a, a standard digital bit is binary, and it is either in a zero state or in a one state, but never both at the same time. It's one or the other. And, and, so, and so therefore, um, like the complexity is very limited with, with a, a binary bit. This model here, however, is as, as a quantum bit. And a quantum bit, if you've heard anything about quantum computing before, you'll know that um, a quantum bit can be in zero and one simultaneously. So the, the binary logic, so if this sphere is like the Earth or, or, or something with poles, the zero, zero position of, from what would have been a digital binary state, zero would be on the North Pole, one would be on the South Pole. And if this was binary, we'd only have those two poles, two points. There's no dimensions there. It's just two points. Whereas a quantum bit is, is actually represented by the surface of this sphere. And you can see you've, all of a sudden you've gone from something that's just two points to something that's 3D. The complexity has exploded already. Um, the equator represents an equal superposition of zero and one. 
So any if if this so this point here can be anywhere on the surface of the sphere, and it sort of shows you how much of zero you have and how much of a one component you have. And when this point is on the on the equator, it's zero and one at the same time. But it's not just one possibility of zero and one. There's actually almost an inf well an infinite number because it's con a continuous variable. There's an infinite different number of possibilities of having a qubit in zero and one. So why the reason I'm showing you this is to sort of show you how complex even just a single bit is when you go from the binary to the non-binary. Quantum computing is a non-binary or a queer computer. This is using, you remember I said particles start to behave like waves and they start to spread out like slime. This is using that, but formalizing it in a way that we can process information with it. This, this equator is very slimy. There's multiple possibilities happening, happening at once. And there's even, I mean, this I, what I'm saying about this for the sake of time, I'm going to move to the next slide, but there's even more. We could spend like a whole week just learning about this model. Um, there's a lot in this already. And then when you have multiple quantum bits, you can start to create objects within a quantum computer that could never be, I mean, already a quantum bit could not be created with a digital computer, but you can start creating further objects. You've probably heard of something called quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement is um, a phenomena that exists within quantum physics. It's a, it's, it's a physical phenomena. When you have two or more entities, they can start to blur together. They can start to lose their own individuality and join together in a symbiosis that is so strong, you can never retrieve an individual anymore. These two, these two things that previously would have been separated, you know, myself and, and um, someone else were two individuals. But if we blur together, there's no possible way of retrieving an individual out of the system. If you try to, you destroy the system. And um, and one of the features of entanglement is that this, this symbiosis, this strong connection can exist over great distances. So if, if myself and someone else, one, so you're in Italy or, 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 or watching this on YouTube, if we were entangled, um, that can exist across these distances. Obviously that doesn't exist in the, in the macroscopic world. We don't see um, rigid objects start to behave like slime or waves. And we don't, don't see um, individuals blurring into others across big, big distances. We need to zoom in to the microscopic level and make things really cold. So this, this, this image you're seeing in the background here, this is actually some code for a five qubit quantum computer. It's what's known as a circuit diagram. Um, on the left here, you can see this row of zeros. So the, this represents your five qubits, five different qubits going from top to bottom. And as we move along from left to right, these are the different computational gates. This is the boxes and then the boxes with the lines up to the, like the vertical lines represent different computational operations on the qubits. Um, so what 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 this what this um <laughs> what this this circuit diagram is showing you is how to create some entanglement within a quantum computer. And you're creating, if you were to run this code, if you were to write it, um, you know, any of you can go and use IBM's um Tools, there's some small quantum computers, five quantum computers that are free and available online. And you can use those um, now, like not now because I'm talking, but after this lecture. And you can run this code, you could write this code and then you'll generate some entanglement. And when you create entanglement, all different, many possibilities can exist within the quantum computer at once. Um, so rather than just having one combination of zeros and ones, you can have what's known as a superposition. So many different combinations existing at once. So you could have zero, 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 and zero, 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 one, and zero, zero, one, zero, you get my point. And, and if you run this code multiple times, you can start to get these 
different probabilities out of, of um, what states were there previously. Again, we could spend weeks just analysing entanglement. I mean, that's what I pretty much spent eight years doing in my in my um, research um, in different ways. There's so much to be said about this. But the reason I'm bringing it up today is it's this sort of code that I've been using to edit videos, to create animations. And I'm, that's what I'm going to show you in my work now. I'm actually using these probabilities. You can manipulate these these probabilities that you see on the right hand side to sort of start to reveal the wave like nature and the plural nature of quantum physics using quantum computers of the tool. So I'm using this data to then animate and show the worlds to unfold the objects to reveal the invisible processes within quantum computers in my work. So we can start to see traces of what reality is like at its most microscopic. We can start to see queer the queer radical potential of the mic our microscopic reality and this will help us understand how we can better live in the present and in the future so this is a video um, from a performance called slime core which i performed at um Zabludovich collection in uh june this year um, this video was projected behind me while i um, performed a spoken word narrative, a slimy poem, a stream of consciousness. And the reason <clears throat> I wanted to show you it today is because you can see there's actually 32 different videos playing at once in this, this, in this final render. And depending on those probabilities, remember in the last slide on the right hand side, we had that strip of, prob strip of probabilities. Depending on how they shift around because of the quantum relations in the quantum computer, different videos rise to the top and are present and fall down. So even so at the moment, we can see this gold um, video, slimy video on the screen, but there's other possibilities, other realities also existing at once. And it's this multiplicity, this, this idea that we can have multiple stories, multiple narratives, multiple truths all at once. And we can have a paradox where we've got both sides of the coin and they're both equally valid. We don't need to keep reverting back to these binaries. I think this is such an interesting model, given we're living in this, these polarised times at the moment, these slight times of slimy politics. These, these times of like, um, you know, a huge inequalities and so on. How can we allow different voices, different probabilities to all, not probabilities, excuse me, different voices, different narratives, different um, positions, all to have equal weight and to not to exist in a hierarchy, but to rise and fall in relation to each other. So the narrative that I, I created, actually, which was performed in Rome by an Italian actor um, with uh, Roma Europa, um, with um, Rehumanism just a week ago now, um, they, the narrative deals with, talks about the sort of slimy potential of quantum computing and how this can allow us to kind of move beyond kind of some of the slimy negative behaviours of our times. You know, big tech companies appear to be benign, appear to be pleasant, but actually they're collecting a lot of data about us, selling that data without our permission. Um, and quantum computers promise to really extend these modes of surveillance and control. So the narrative of this piece really goes in into these things. Just jump to the next slide. So I've also been making um, glass, um, because quantum physics is quite abstract. I'm sure you, you realize this from a, the slides with the mathematical diagrams. I think this is why I think when you're dealing with concepts that can at first be quite challenging, perhaps for the lay, pe lay people who aren't trained in quantum physics or quantum computing, one of the things that I've been trying to do is to circle what I call the void. Um, you can never observe quantum phenomena directly. If you do, you actually destroy what's happening uh, because of the laws of physics. But you can only reveal traces 
of what there was. So I've been working with different materials, trying to capture the essence through art, using art as a tool to kind of describe some of these phenomena. So I've been working with glass and I'm so pleased to, to have got into this in my practice because I think glass almost mirrors the quantum world. I spoke about when you call quantum particles down close to absolute zero, uh, minus 273 degrees, they start to spread out like a wave, they become slimy. But with glass, we know when we heat glass up to 1200 degrees, it starts to become slimy as well, it becomes molten. And, and these glass sculptures are hard sculpted and so the light sits within them and you can really see um, they kind of become alive, they become animated. Um, so it talks about this liveliness, this fluidity at the heart of matters, at the heart of matter. Um, so this, this gives my audiences another way, a tactile way to understand some of the things that I've been talking about. I'm a, the, the titles are all quite playful. So this is called Jekyll and Slime. So again, thinking about collapsing binaries um, as well. And thinking about tactility and embodiment and how we learn through different senses, you know. So when I was perform, when I was working as a quantum scientist, I was working with mathematics, um, I was a theorist, I didn't work in the lab, but my colleagues in the lab would re be re uh, using a reductionist method of science, a scientific method, um, whereas we learn through, through so many different ways, spiritual, the embodied, the intuitive, the paranormal, through, yeah, and so I've been using slime, um, physical slime, you know, like the stuff kids make, and inviting my audiences to touch it and understand quantum physics through the power of touch. While I'm talking, they can understand slimy entanglements um, through, you know, I invite them to massage with slime into each other's hands. And they perhaps find this quite strange. Maybe it's quite a queer sensation touching the other in yourself, in someone else. Um, so touch can do a lot um, to help work with these otherworldly concepts as well. So now I'm gonna show you a clip from Ent, um, which Carlos mentioned at the start. Ent was commissioned by Light Art Space earlier this year and uses quantum entanglement and other different algorithms from a quantum computer to animate um, hybrid creatures in a fantasy world. Um, to enable audiences to enter this immersive projection and to really feel moved and swayed by the plural potentiality of quantum physics. But there's also a moment where the world collapses. Collapse comes from quantum physics, but it also talks about the potential collapse of, of different structures through this paradigm and changing technology. When quantum computers are fully developed, they will in my, I would say 95% certain they're going to change the world in ways we cannot yet envision, um, in ways of a similar scale to the internet. And um, so this allows audiences to feel these um, ideas again in their body. And I think this is really um, an important way of, way of um, working because the jargon around these technologies, the, lit, the, the scientific words, may feel quite overwhelming. So this invites people into a world using their senses.
doing it. Okay, well, um, I think we'll move to the next slide, but you could see there the different patterns in the world that were um, unfolding. And um, here you see the work referenced a very famous work, The Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch, um, because this is one of the first artworks ever to be made with quantum computing. Um, I wanted to give audiences a way into the themes that I wanted to discuss using something that's very well known. So here you can see you're in the garden from the central panel of Bosch is triptych. I wanted to really center hybridity, um, monsters. I wanted to celebrate mon monsters. I wanted to celebrate things that don't fit inside the usual binary taxonomies. I wanted to celebrate the idea of putting two things together that shouldn't be together. Like we saw the, the zero and one of the qubit, um, and how those are now superpo superposed on that equator, we could have different combinations of those. I wanted audiences to encounter a series of hybrid creatures and then use the, the data from IBM's quantum computers to animate those hybrid creatures so they fell apart and become boundaryless and formless and start to entangle through the motion, through the movement of the images with different members of the audience and groups of people. And I, I didn't use virtual VR headsets because I wanted audiences really to be with their bodies and to be with each other. Um, because while you can have an avatar in VR, I think it's really nice to um to, to experience this 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 with with yourself and feel destabilized by the movement. Um, so here you can see um, at the start of uh, the animation, um, this quantum computer with tentacles really opens up and all of this blurry fragments inside was some of the animations from quantum computing, some hybrid creatures. You have this quantum computer render in the background and these tentacles are like the quantum computing tentacles of big tech trying to sort of peer into our ear, innermost queerness trying to simulate every possible thing to find the ultimate truth of truth. You know, scientists are using quantum computers not to explore necessarily the materiality of quantum physics, but really to solve problems much, much faster than a digital computer ever could. So tentacles appearing into our reality. But what I'm interested in is exploring the materiality of quantum physics itself, the, the entanglements, the superpositions. What do these look like? And how can we feel them and understand them? And how does that lead us to think about new ways of connecting and being with each other? Here again, you can see um, this is working with really, really big entangled states here. And this, this object has exploded across the screen and all different possibilities that could exist are existing at once. There's a breathing like sensation to the work because um, because of how time exists within a within a quantum computer as this cyclical process um, going on. Um, when I say I'm working with quantum computers, I'm working with the small prototype ones. Um, obviously, they they're not big enough to solve prob like scientific problems yet with good, with accuracy. But what they are good at is making art. So I encourage anyone who's interested to start understanding how to do this. You can go on IBM's website and look for their textbook for how to start programming these things. It's, it's difficult, but it, of course it is possible. And when this, when ENT was presented in London, I wanted to add another layer of criticality around this. So I really um, started working with um, a fictional company, QX, to think about how Te technology companies appropriate art to kind of art wash and to what I mean by art wash is to really like cover up some of the more negative aspects of their practices. So in the end, I ended up criticizing my own my own work. Um, so this is one of the videos where I'm reflecting back on end and adding a layer of criticality around end. 
Um, let me know if you can hear the sound in this video, okay? I'm sure you will. But, um... If memories are like time travel to the past, and dreams are time travel to the future, then experiences are portals to other dimensions. Well, at QX, we are definitely entering into other dimensions. Experts said that quantum computers would never be built. Well, if memories are like time travel to the past, and dreams are time travel to the future, then experiences are portals to other dimensions. Well, at QX, we are definitely entering into other dimensions. Experts said that quantum computers would never be built. Well, we've done it. With quantum parallel processing and exponentially accelerating computing, we have the real thing. The world's first quantum experience. Such a fantastic example of art and technology. Inside a quantum computer, all possible outcomes exist at once. Now, in 2022, the world's largest quantum computer has just 127 quantum bits, but that's capable of 10 to the power of 38 parallel computations taking place at once. And while it's impossible to experience these realities directly, RQX artists have discovered ingenious methods to bring these dimensions to life. Hypothesizing, testing, inventing, designing, experimenting, measuring and prototyping all the different ways to create quantum experience. This was enormous. The challenges and level of risk involved were huge. Allow me to introduce you to ENT, an immersive experience like no other. Like classical immersive experiences, we start with a famous work of art. Then you enter a quantum immersive experience. Ent changed how we look at art completely. Did you realize that when using a quantum computer, you're exploring extra dimensions? It sounds like science fiction, but it's not. It's just science. And now, at QX, we're combining it with art and analytics. As quantum computing develops, we're working to entice audiences with our entirely new quantum aesthetic. And that's not all. Today, we're excited to reveal our roadmap for the future of quantum experiences. As full-scale quantum computing nears, our immersive experience will interact with audiences like never before. Meet Entangle, our second generation of quantum experience. In 2024, Entangle will introduce our patented quantum neuroanalytics with forward-pushing, cutting-edge aesthetics. Our analytics will provide your business with a wealth of data and insights to achieve unprecedented commercial advantages. When combined with our Accelerator program, this will help you tailor individual immersive experiences for each and every consumer. QX. Quantum expertise. Quantum experiences. Quantum extend. QX. Quantum expertise. Quantum experiences. Quantum extended. So that was actually a parody of one of the IBM quantum computing um, keynote videos from last year. The language that I'm using is mostly borrowed from big tech. Um, and I'm really trying to, um, while I, I can talk about this while I play this, what I'm doing is weaving fact and fiction together 
to highlight the different belief systems, the different promises around quantum computing. How are big tech selling quantum computers right now? Even though they can't do anything, they're selling them for tens of millions of dollars and more. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm appropriating some of this technology, but then through the slimy glitches, the quantum animations in end, proposing an alternative beyond language that's more visceral, more spiritual, more interconnected. Um, and it's necessarily it's necessarily not anchored in, in something that's fixed. It's necessarily anchored in something that's fluid and slime-like. So as you can see on the screen right now, this is another video from um, Arbeit Gallery, my show at Arbeit Gallery in London. And it's through the fictional company that I set up, QX. And the text, are you ready? Um, all of the text in this, is, except the parts relating to Ent, are lifted from different companies selling quantum computers. And they're really promising, you know, these vast sums of wealth to anyone who invests within them are really promising absolute control over nature and us if you invest in them and this is all a big fiction it's all a belief system so I'm high I'm not only making these works to sort of introduce audiences to quantum computing because not everyone will know what it is but to start to sort of generate help people to generate a new language and understanding around these things so So here's some more images from the show. And I think what I would do is, I've got a couple of minutes, I think. So I'm just gonna quickly whiz through the final slides um, of a workshop that I've been running with Neon Digital in Dundee called Quantum World Unshaping. So I'm sure you've heard about world building. So for me, the word building is too fixed. It suggests you build a world and it's stable and that's how it is. And then you can play out scenarios or different narratives within that world. What I'm interested in is deconstructing current sort of narratives or ideas or objects through the lens of quantum. So to make them plural and queer and entangled and then reconstruct other shape shifting fluid worlds in their place. So it's an ongoing process of becoming. So I call it quantum world and shaping. So I've been running workshops where audience members are given these different cards, um, participants are given these cards with different scenarios on quantum, which quantum phenomena, so maybe entanglement or superposition, probability of these things happening, where do they happen at the level of bodies, at the level of cities, and how far into the future do these things happen? Five years, 10 years, 100 years. And participants have to come up with scenarios a quantum world and shaping scenario um, where different things happen depending on the cards that they get uh, so this is um, a workshop with 12 to 16 year olds thinking about the lower one is thinking about non-humans and kind of different species through the manipulation of and simulation of molecules but it's very non-linear the story flows back forwards and black backwards as a symmetry and the top image is about kind of the dangers of technology and um, although it's quite celebratory in the visuals. Scientists um, were very concrete, less visual perhaps, but came up with good narratives or interesting narratives around the potential of these tools. And it's interesting to invite scientists to reflect on some of the potential impacts, ethical, societal impacts of technologies because quite often they're just working on the science, they're just in their labs or, or in their offices and not really thinking about connections to the wider world. I know that from experience. And then we also ran the workshop with artists in Glasgow. And here we were really focused on non-linearity of the narratives. How can we make narratives that are quantum in itself? So, you know, as humans, we like to tell cause and effect stories. But these started to tw literally twist these around and they almost look like some sort of Dada or surrealist collage. Um, so that was really exciting as well. So I will end there. Feel free to ask me questions about anything um, that I've mentioned. I'd be really, really happy to share anything else with you. Thank you.
Ricardo. Thank you, Libby. Thank you for your very, very inspiring lecture. Um, there are actually a couple of questions in our Q&A uh, mm -hmm. section from Faith. I don't know if you can see them or if you want me to read them. Yeah, I, I can see them. So I, I can read them out and then answer them if that's the most useful for you. Um, the first one says from Faith says, why did you shift careers? What do you think art can communicate that science cannot? And I, I yeah, I often get asked this question um, because, you know, it's, it's quite a big shift. It's quite a risky shift. Um, but essentially, I would have gone and studied arts at a younger age, at 18. But um, I was also very good at maths and physics and teachers, friends, family all suggested go and do that. They called it a proper job and that you would never make much money uh, perhaps going into the arts. Um, so I did and then fell in love with quantum physics because it's very great to, to kind of understand these concepts. You need a lot of imagination. They're very philosophical. They're very creative concepts. Um, and I pursued that for, I mean, well, 12 years in total. Um, and but I was always saving money to go back and study um, at art college. And yeah, so I think I think it was more when more when um, I had enough cash to then go and study art. It was always going to happen one day. But then I came back to art with this massive like expertise in quantum physics, quantum computing, which I think is really brings a different voice to the art world, hopefully. And what can art communicate that science cannot? Well, we create meaning in a much richer way than scientists. As a scientist, like, you know, I was a mathematician and you're, it's like the TV show, Big Bang Theory, where you're like writing equations and, um, and you're really following the logics of mathematics and trying to extend knowledge, but within this sort of domain of science, so what's known, and you're not really thinking generally um i wasn't thinking about the wider impacts of these technologies because you have to publish papers else you won't get your next job or you won't get that grant you know we, in science it's, it's still a very political and almost capitalist system of competition and finding that new research and publishing and so on so i think in art i mean sure art is capitalistic as well definitely but we create meaning by, you know, like a magpie finding, you know, I'm using slime to just talk about quantum physics. I'm connecting it to hybridity and Bosch's monsters. And, and, and we can have discussions like these ones where we can unpack the ideas and concepts in a more playful and intuitive way. So I guess in art, we can use weave between different systems of knowledge, which are all entangled anyway. Whereas in science, it's very rigid and in the box. Yeah. Shall I, shall I jump to the next question in the chat afterwards as well? So we get those done. Yeah, um, okay, um, I will. Uh, Faith also asks, what are my thoughts on the metaverse? Um, metaverse will be very interesting, but I would prefer to wait personally until there's a quantum metaverse, <laughs> which will be far more interesting than trying to replicate everything we've got here on Earth with all the contingent problems um i i haven't worked much with web3 metaverse i mean i work with games engine technology but not directly with web3 um i haven't felt very inspired by it because it just seems to be mirroring all the problems we've got wrong with the world you know for instance if you think of nfts they're a decentralized on, we're on decentralized, the contracts are on decentralized platforms on different blockchains, yet we're still gatekeepers. There's still like, you know, I just don't see anything changing. And I think quantum computing also will probably propagate the status quo as well because of who owns the technology. But through the concepts of quantum computing, through the concepts of entanglement, and um, superposition, the pluralities and the connections. I feel, I feel, um, I feel like there's something else that we could explore that takes us beyond the present and beyond the binary categorizations, beyond these high like hierarchies. 
Newtonian and so on into something that's more queer and more fluid and more relational yeah so yeah that's it um is there any are there any questions in the room or shall I jump yes. to Okay, yeah, yes, there okay. are a question from our from in, of our residents here in presence, oh. please. Uh, hi, my name is Polly. Um, I've actually really been interested in physics my whole life, and uh, uh -huh. I'm really excited to hear a lecture today. I've never really met a real quantum physicist. So I have something, a question that's really philosophical in nature that has been, I've been thinking about this like forever. And that's the question of entanglement and locality and non-locality. Uh, I, I want to know what's the current stance uh, of the scientific community or your stance on this, um, this phenomenon. Because uh, I, I think when Einstein first discovered this phenomenon, he was really upset because there's supposed to be this universal limit on how fast things can go, which is the speed of light, on how fast information can travel on, you know, this time limit, which is, you know, see the constant. Um, and uh, I'm, I just want to know if you are, is the current scientific community, the goal trying to uh, uh, kind of make this, uh, solve this issue, make this a part of the current theory or is it kind of just accepting it and just using its potential to already create a technology that we want? So. Yes, so kind of both. <laughs> so, I mean, of course, some scientists are just pragmatic and they just use these phenomena to create, you know, different quantum technologies, quantum internet, which we haven't spoken about, quantum cryptography and quantum computers. But then there's also another portion of the scientific community who for the last hundred years have been testing these, you know, um, testing non-locality and entangle, they're related in, um, to see if Einstein was correct or whether there is another theory. No, so Einstein would have liked to believe there's another theory below quantum physics that actually explains everything in terms of something that's local and real as well um, so that we don't need to invoke this sort of spooky action at a distance this non-locality and um, what we've found is it's been tested I, I mean I don't know thousands of times in the last century and actually Einstein was wrong um, reality is ontologically non-local so there's no way of assigning local properties to these entangled objects um, in, at all. There's no theory that can go underneath, underneath that, underneath um, quantum mechanics as, within the current paradigms, unless there's a huge paradigm shift, uh, maybe involving gravity, because um, general relativity and gravity hasn't been reconciled with quantum mechanics yet. But um, so actually the Nobel Prize for Physics this year, 22, was awarded to scientists that have been testing this um, using, uh, like theoretically, proposing the theory and then testing this in the lab. And yeah, um, I think that's everything to say about that. I mean, we could spend, again, we could spend a long time talking about these things. Um, they're still being different, they call them loopholes. Scientists are testing loopholes. Um, to check there's no other ways of this happening, but every single result is coming back against Einstein in this case, actually, yeah. I hope that helps. But if you Google the Nobel Prize this year, you can like do some research yourself into, into these things as well. All right, thank you. There's another question from Asuka mm. from the Q&A. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, Asuka, sorry. <laughs> I was zoned out a bit there. Um, Asuka says, thank you for your inspiring lecture. Thank you, Asuka. Um, I wanted you to ask for your opinion on how design and art differ. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so I'm not a designer. I wouldn't, you know, I, I like to kind of think of myself as working across art, science and technology, but I did actually teach in a design course for five years at the Royal College of Art. Um, so design basically 
It's difficult because there's so many entanglements between art and design. It's really difficult to split them to be like their own individual entities. But I think design, my experience, I'm not talking generally, is that design tends to be more um, to a brief, trying to solve a problem, um, trying to communicate something maybe more directly. Um, design can be wider, you know, you could design a piece of code, you could design um, an experiment for a scientist. Um, so it tends to be more recipe based. But then there's so many examples that counter what I just say as well. So it's not like clear cut. Art can, you know, if you think of installation art, like, you know, physical installation art, it's so non-linear, it's so affective. It, it's almost like generative if there's videos in it and, and so on. And meaning is produced through the juxtaposition of so many different things. So you kind of, I mean, with anything in the world, I suppose you lose control of it when you put it out in the world. But I think with art, perhaps more so, um, I mean, since Bart's the death of the author, people have been talking about how, you know, it's, it's a system of, of, of meanings to be read by the audience members. And I think design is less, less so. Um, and, it, and it can, oh, it's so difficult because, yeah, like art is um, also entangled with the market so much, but design tends to be a bit more aligned with with corporations probably but feel free to contradict me on everything that I just said I'm happy to live with paradox I'm happy to have all of these contradictions in my mind yeah I hope that helps Asuka thank you for the question thank you there's another question from our guys here in presence hi Libby um, thank you for your lecture one of the things that I was um really taken with was the focus that you have on kind of audience and I can't think of many art lectures that I've seen where an artist focused so much on the sort of reception of their work and then also these um, moments that you have kind of throughout where you're finding ways to focus on sensory experiences and the kind of embodied knowledge and I'm wondering um, too if you could speak a, a little bit more about kind of how you're working with all of this data and information and these really complex narratives and then finding these moments of sort of sensory exploration um, and how you think about audience throughout your sort of creative practice as you're making a piece. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess because I have, particularly with this body of work, I've been thinking about audience because I'm aware that it would be really, really easy to alienate people. And when you make art, like it's such a privilege for people to spend time in your worlds that you're creating. You know, our attention and our time is, is precious. And, and, and also when I'm having fun and making something that feels quite playful, I hope, I, I always see that as, in, as an intuitive knowledge that I'm I'm on the right track like if I'm like yeah this is, like if I'm struggling to make something and I'm not having fun with it I think perhaps that might show through my work um so maybe it's like an entangled relationship with my audiences it's not that I'm like trying to be didactic in my work but I'm there's because I believe in care as well um and responsive I mean we haven't spoke about responsibility today but um when you read if you read someone called Karen Barad I'm sure you've heard of her who was a quantum physicist and now a, a feminist philosopher and they write a lot about how um entanglement can lead to like a non-local responsibility I suppose that's how I see my relationship with the audience as well so how I find these moments of sensitivity or embodied intuition I think it comes quite instinctively or intuitively to myself if I'm resonating myself if I'm happy or finding moments you know if I'm if I'm sort of grinning at myself and being playful with myself while I'm making the work or with my because something like end I work with a team of developers 
if we're like this is you know if we're chatting in slack and we're like this is so weird oh my gosh let's try this let's try this it kind of comes out through play and I think which is almost like what we didn't have in science in a way I feel compared to the kind of maybe pressure and the the boundedness of being a practicing scientist it felt really restrictive and um even though I'm dealing with these concepts that are so expansive it felt really it became really boring (laughs) because you're just in this like box of science and now it's more like open and and um having fun and yeah so I think if we're doing that as a team or if I'm doing that then hopefully it comes across to the audience and it's not to say everyone resonates with my work they don't but I'd rather have a group of people that resonate with it rather than it's just kind of academic or not really connecting at all yeah I hope that helped yeah thank you more questions there is one more question Oh, hey, uh, me again. So hey. another quick question. It's like very, I guess, science fiction because I really like science fiction. So I, I don't know if you like it. But uh, so is it possible for information to travel instantaneously using entanglement? Ah, uh, yes. So I didn't mention that before. Um, no, it isn't. Um, like, how can I explain this quickly and easily? So when you have entanglement, all different possibilities exist at once between the two entities that are entangled. So let me let me explain. Um, you could, if if we think of qubits, quantum bits, you could have um, both entities are in zero zero, and at the same time they're both in one one. And and so we've got a superposition of the different possibilities, but they're shared between the two parties, and they can be really far apart. And, and when, say, if someone makes a measurement over here on the left-hand side of this entity, my left-hand side, then um, that collapses the superposition. So that, that changes it randomly either to being in 1-1 one, one or 0-0. Zero, zero. But this person or this entity over here doesn't know that collapse has happened. Um, so they don't know that this person or this thing has made a measurement here. This is getting quite technical, so I hope it makes sense. So if they were to look at their their part of the entangled state, their their particle or whatever, they would see it's either in zero, zero or one, one. But this doesn't tell them any information because they don't know if this person's made the measurement either. Because when when you make a measure, we didn't get into quantum measurement in this talk, but when you make a measurement of of all of these different possibilities, it collapses them to just one possibility and that happens randomly. So when when this one does it, they don't know if this one's done it either. They have to talk to each other to see if they're both measured. And that talking has to be across um, a classical or a digital channel. So it has to be using light. It has to be through through standard information and that can't travel faster than the speed of light so therefore you can't have any information traveling faster than the speed of light does that make sense because that was a really quick explanation using my hands no no that was really what i was looking for thank you okay brilliant there's still a, there's another question from faith in the chat shall i shall i go ahead i don't mind if you've got the time just to quickly answer this one as well Yes, let's go with the last one. Last one, okay. Yeah. Um, thanks, Faith. What do you believe is the responsibility of a creative talk about social, economical and environmental concerns? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I've given talks before and um, the sort of organiser has said, you know, art doesn't need to deal with any of this. It doesn't, art can be autonomous. It can... And therefore, a creative talk can be fully just about um, aesthetic concerns or formal formal concerns. But there is an argument to be made, and I'm not the first to make it. Um, lots of others have, of course, that aesthetics are political, aesthetics are social. I mean, it, to me, it just seems 
crazy to think that like formal concerns of art are independent to the world to the social economic to the environmental surely even from these abstract patterns behind me right now if you really read the patterns and think about what they could mean well everyone will have a different meaning but you can connect them to to something our, our whole concepts are you know our whole history of learning concepts are all grounded in the real world so we start to see things in terms of real world concepts and phenomena and bodily experiences so for me I think so I guess who the responsibility of a creative talk I mean I've only touched on a little bit of the sort of social economic and invite well I have got into it I could go a lot deeper into it as well and I have in other talks so it, is, it depends on who you're speaking to but I think you know we live in a world that's as you know is polarized we've got the climate crisis which you know is on us already um and in, ecology is something that is implicit with all of my works and with one or two coming up will be more explicit I think I think there is a responsibility there personally um I would tend to shun away from any talk nowadays nowadays but you know any talk that um doesn't touch on these issues because they're so pressing and we need to understand new models of how to work with each other and to be in this world and that's why I think quantum physics of core concepts can give this new model of how we can understand the world differently um and I think that's what quantum computing should be used for so I'll end it there final question Thank you, Libby. Thank you very much. Thank you from all our residents here. And thank you to our online community and uh, see you next time. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye.